Definitely from above.
See, it's the second Sunday of Christmas. But we haven't had any Christmas yet. Who wrote the book of Romans? A blessed morning as we gather together. We gather together during this uh, Christmas season as it brings us forward throughout this season, remembering our Lord having come here into the world for us, leading us up towards Epiphany, which will be coming up here this next week, remembering all of what our Lord has done as we go into Epiphany and then Lent, as we continue to walk through this season that's been going with us basically since March. And yet the Lord continues to watch over us and bless us as we go forward. A couple of uh, announcements as we go forward. Some of our things are going to kind of go back normalish as we go forward. Uh, and so we will continue to have our Thursday evening services at 7 o'clock. 
Uh, everything will be online. And as we go into our uh, 7 o'clock services, just a reminder that our 7 o'clock services and our Sunday morning services have some overlap, but are definitely different as they go forward, both in the uh, sermon and in other aspects of our services. So some similarities, but they are different worship services during those two worship, worship services at 7 and on Sunday morning. Also, as we go forward through this time, starting tomorrow, tomorrow, yep, is when uh, we'll start again with uh, schools picking up again. Uh, many of the schools are still in distance learning, so we will continue tomorrow uh, with basically full online school taking place with about 20 or so kids uh, in our uh, downstairs area in our classroom areas. So that will be starting up again starting tomorrow. And as other decisions are made, we will continue to make changes. That seems like this uh, whole year, hasn't it? Continue, what's the next change that we're going to make as we go forward? Uh, and lastly, as we go forward, uh, following our service today, uh, we'll have our Bible study time. I'll be leading the Bible study today. That will be at 1015. And we are uh, in the last quarter of our going through all of Scripture. And so we're in the last section going forward. And so we're into uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations this month. Once we get through that, we go into the uh, Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. We have about a five-minute thing every day kind of connecting and uh, looking at those passages that we have for reading every day. And we'll go forward with that. Continuing for the next three months, and we'll have gone all through Scripture together as His people. And so as we gather together, our opening hymn for today is Angels from the Realms of Glory. We'll sing together as we start our first three verses of that hymn. Please rise.
entering our baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. He shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. We say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a moment to quiet, to reflect upon our sins, our need for Jesus to come for us. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left done done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We just deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a god ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the beasts from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our hymn, A Great and Mighty One.
Almighty God, you have poured into our hearts the true light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light may shine forth in our lives. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Later, as we get to our Gospel reading, we'll be seeing that one passage that we have from St. Luke about Jesus as he's about 13 years old, and in our Old Testament text, as we come here to 1 Kings, the third chapter, we find another young man, Solomon, as he comes before the Lord, and we see those, the questions that he, uh, he's basically said, ask me what you want, and basically says, Lord, help me to do what you have set before me in your will. So from 1 Kings, the third chapter, the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Now Gibeon, the Lord, appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in, right, uh, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this your great people? To please the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I would my girls come forward for the children's message. Now, on the bottom, 
What image is on the very bottom? A dolphin. Fish. A dolphin? Pretty close. It is a fish. You got it. So on the bottom, we have a fish. That's right there. And this is, okay, I'll show everyone. Everybody can see it because that's big, right? Trust me, there's a fish on the bottom. Now when you look at this, the fish that's there on the bottom, uh, the Greek word for that is uh, ixos, okay? You don't have to remember that. Wait, is that what's spelled on there? You got it. So that's what's spelled on there. And this was one of the earliest symbols of being a Christian. Did you know that? Now, if you can look up there, you can see why. And I have this slide, so I decided to pick this one. And so there you see, way up on top there, you got this, a fish, right? Yeah. In fact, that's how sometimes they would show one another that they were Christian, especially when they were being persecuted. They would show that symbol right there of the fish to say, you know what? I am a Christian. Now, what does the symbol mean, right? Okay, Trisha? You got it, absolutely. It says, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. That's the meaning behind this. And where does that come from? You see, that is the Greek word for fish, right up there, right? Now, each one of those in Greek means a, is the start of one of those words. It doesn't fit in English, because English and Greek are different languages. Woo! Now, right here you see Ixos, and there you have how it kind of goes a little bit into English. And so, what all of that means, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. That's what's, it's one of the earliest Christian creeds as well, about what is it that we believe. And if it's really good during Christmas, so we'll come on over here. And if it's really good, no, because we're coming over here. So if it's really good, because looking at the fish that tells us Jesus Christ, and so what was the babe's name? Jesus. Jesus. And he's the Christ, which means the Messiah that was promised from long ago. And then the second part, and he was born to Mary, right? Yeah. But he is also God's son. And the last part of that, and he is our Savior. So he came to save us. So when we look at Christmas and God having come, Jesus, born of Mary, Jesus, God's Son, and why did all this happen? Because Jesus was supposed to save the world from sin. To save the world from sin. You got it. Absolutely. And so that's why we have that fish as one of the earliest Christian symbols. So let's have a prayer, okay? Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, we thank you that you're the Christ. We thank you that you're the Christ. We thank you that you're God's Son. We thank you that you're God's Son. We thank you that you are our Savior. We thank you that you are our Savior. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our epistle comes from Ephesians, the first chapter. So as Paul is starting this letter to the Christians in Ephesus, he tells them, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless, before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, 
to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the Holy Gospel as we sing the Alleluia. Scriptures, 
and he sent him into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, for his kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiping and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we sing, very much following along with our gospel reading, with following along with Jesus in the temple, within the Father's house. We have the one of 
God having sent Jesus into the world. And we look at the facts of what happened and took place. That he was born of Mary, Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew then jumps ahead a couple of years. As he then brings forward the wise men from afar. It's a couple of years later. That's why when he comes up to Herod, when the wise men come up to Herod, and then Herod has the slaughter of the innocents that happens, you then run into that moment where then everyone two years old and under are the ones that Herod seeks after. That's where we see him then go down to Egypt. We then see calling them out of Egypt and bringing them to Nazareth. And Matthew's point of bringing all of that information, of going forward and talking about the wise men, of talking about Egypt, about talking of Nazareth, of talking about Galilee. Matthew's point is that Jesus, all throughout his life, was fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. Throughout all of his ministry, all of his life, when he was a baby, and had to be carried from one place to another. The point of Matthew was that Isaiah and Ezekiel and Malachi and all of them and Micah were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Because the teachers of the law, the people that were preaching, that were teaching, that were in the law, the ones that told Herod, well it says out of Bethlehem will come the Messiah. And they tell the wise men that when they come. When all of that happens, the point of Matthew is that it was fulfilling what God had told through those prophets. That God's word is sure and certain and true and 100% reliable in what is said and given to us. Now, we go through those first two stories, but now we jump over to Luke. And Luke gives us that third story which we had in our Gospel reading not too long ago. And in that third reading, we run into Jesus going to Jerusalem. Now, we only had the three stories. It was three times, and then we're up to Jesus being baptized. And if you go into John, you only go about maybe a third of the way through John, and then you're in Holy Week already, practically. So John goes through like about nine chapters, and then we're at Holy Week plus a couple of days. Luke pulls back. And why does Luke have these stories? Not because he heard them from Jesus' mouth. Because Luke, a Gentile, was converted later on. He was not one of the twelve. He was not one of the 72. He was not one of the crowd that was listening to Jesus. But he was a good modern type historian. Meaning, he went back to the original sources to get his information. And as I've said a few times, as many of you have probably heard this before, he got this information most likely when he and Mary were in Jerusalem at the same time. They were in the same city. Luke, a historian, I doubt that he just skipped over Mary. So he went to Mary. And kind of what we have here in Luke is Mary's recollection of what happened and took place, of where she was at in the midst of all of this. So you have Jesus kind of just becoming a teenager. I'm not going to make any jokes about teenagers. Don't worry, Alex. I could make them, but I won't. But here he is. And they're going down to Jerusalem. About a two days journey going forward. Going all the way down there. And they would gather with their friends. They would gather with their families. They would all be together. They would take that trek down there. Going to Jerusalem. And as they were there, they were celebrating the Passover. Fascinating. Luke only talks about the Passover in two parts of his entire, in, of his whole gospel. Obviously one time pass, uh, in Holy Week, when Jesus, the Lamb of God, goes to Jerusalem during the Passover, institutes and begins communion, 
brings everything forward. And then the Lamb of God that all of Passover was looking towards, Jesus goes to that cross. The Passover, very rightly, looking at the sacrifice of the Lamb for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus is the sacrifice for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And so they go down to Jerusalem on the Passover. And I kind of love the words that Luke brings here. Because Luke says, they went down to the Passover as was their normal way of going about things. You could almost hear those words coming from Mary, couldn't you? We went down to, we went to Grandma's house every Christmas. Here, we went down to Jerusalem every Passover. And we had my grand, and we had our grandma come along with us, or we had my cousins with us, and we would all get together, and together we would go as a family unit, as a family gathering together. For safety, for love, kind of having all the kids playing together as they went around. So they would go down to Jerusalem for the Passover, looking all the way back when God took the people of Israel out of Egypt. And then they had the sacrifice of the lambs, and you had the blood of the lambs upon the posts, and the angel of death went over those places where the blood of the lamb was, which very truly was looking forward to Christ, looking forward to the lamb that by his blood, which washes over us, we are cleansed and forgiven. And so Luke only brings up the Passover twice as he goes forward. Luke, or I mean John, he kind of does it every single time. John kind of brings forward every celebration. But Luke is trying to make a connection. And we only find it here in Luke because the connection of Jesus going down there during the Passover. And the next time we find the Passover, Jesus is saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Take and drink. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. He's making the point that as Jesus went down to Jerusalem, even at that point, he was looking forward to what he would do. He was looking forward to what would happen and what would take place. And even as a teenager, he knew who he was. Because he kind of go forward. And you have that, and this is an old painting, and I kind of like the image of what's going on there. Because the way that the artist put this together and rendered it, all of the image is centered on Jesus. Very rightly so. And you just kind of look at the dark and the light that's put together there, and all of the teachers of the law, some of whom probably 20 years later were ones that were actively seeking to have Jesus killed. Probably some of those that were listening to Jesus then, that were in awe of him, were probably also some of that same crowd that were saying on that Good Friday, crucify him, crucify him. Because they saw this boy, they saw this young man, depending on how you would use the terms, and they saw the wisdom and the blessings of what were going on there. But they still had a bit of selfishness within them. Maybe here comes the one who will be the Messiah, but their thought process was this would be the Messiah, and if we're close enough to him, then we get a good place in the kingdom. And in case we wonder if it's just them, remember it was the disciples as well that went forward and said, Jesus, which one of us is the greatest? Remember, it was the sons of Zebedee's mother who came to Jesus and said, Jesus, put one in your right hand and one in your left hand in the coming kingdom. The disciples had the same thought process, unfortunately. And even here, Mary wasn't quite understanding all of what was taking place. But even there, and you can kind of see it in the picture, 
all eyes, all thoughts, all centering upon Jesus, who is the light that has come into the darkness. He is the center. And when you have all darkness around you and you have a light come up, where does everybody's eyes go? The light. The light. Exactly. And that's what's going on here. All the eyes are turning to the light that has come. As Jesus is down there, as Jesus is preaching, proclaiming, even as the one who's so young, in those days, you couldn't go forward into the synagogues or the temple and read the scriptures aloud until you were 30 years old. And in case anybody was trying to do math, 30 years old, 13 years old, 13 years old is younger than 30. And so not only was he, so he wasn't even allowed to read the scriptures, and yet here he was teaching the greatest teachers there in the temple. And then Mary, having been with her family, gathered together, thought, well, Jesus is off with his cousins. Jesus is playing with his friends. They're all together. They probably did that going down every single year. So the fact that Jesus was playing with his friends, playing with his cousins, playing with his family was nothing new. It was probably just a thing they did every single year. Ah, uh, Jesus is over there with, just picking a name out of the ether, Matthew. <laughs> And he's over there, and they're having a good old time. But then they try to gather at night, and Jesus isn't there. They don't know where he's at. Now imagine, now this is probably where, in Mary's mind, this stuck out like nothing else. All of a sudden, you can't find your child. Can you imagine a greater fear that a mother or a father would have? Then all of a sudden, you can't find him. And it's bad enough if it's for 10 minutes. Imagine where Mary was for three days. Imagine her emotional state, having looked in Jerusalem and looked around and saw him for three days and could not find him. Now do you see the second part here that Luke is wanting to direct us to? From Mary's point of view, Jesus was lost. Was Jesus lost? We know no. He was in his father's house. He was where he needed to be. Nevertheless, here she was looking for him. And notice that it's three days that she was looking for Jesus until she finally found him. She was looking and searching day after, and was it 72 hours? Don't know. Could have been less, could have been a little bit more. Depends on how you define your terms. But for three days, she was searching for Jesus and could not find him. And then, practically having given up, she goes to the temple and she sees here is Jesus. He is alive and he is well. Then you skip ahead to that other Passover, right? You skip ahead to that Holy Week. And there you had Mary again on that Holy Week. As she saw Jesus put up upon that cross. As she saw Jesus suffer and die, using another word, and be lost to her. And she couldn't find him. Until on that third day, as Jesus was raised again from the dead. Now, when did Mary exactly see Jesus raising the dead? We're not told what day. Probably that very day she heard at least from the disciples as the word was getting around fast and fast. And you can imagine if word had come that Jesus was alive, the disciples would have told Mary. But all of a sudden, here he is. The one that I thought was lost. He is alive. You can imagine that incredible joy. Seeing the young teenager. He's okay. I've been searching for three days. Praise the Lord. And 
Luke is making his point forward as well. Probably just taken off of Mary as she had pondered these things, had thought about these things, and probably just laid this out for Luke. As Mary then, at one point, seeing Jesus alive again. Imagine that joy on that holy week. Imagine that incredible Easter time. He is risen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for what he has done and for what he has accomplished. Luke, as he brings us forward, is very much letting us know, even as a teenager, Jesus was taking the steps going to that day. And that throughout his life, he fulfilled all of the law. Now just to bring forward, especially for the young ones, we get to that fourth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. And I just wanted to bring up one last point here. We're supposed to honor our father and mother. I know all the rest of that's rather small. So I thought I would just read it. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Honor, obey, love, cherish. As Jesus was looking forward, even at this age, being in his father's house, looking forward, to holy, where he would be the sacrifice for all of our sins. He knew he had to continue to lead that perfect life, to lead that sinless life. And yes, that does mean Jesus obeyed his parents. Jesus listened to his mother and to his father, and he honored them. And he cherished them. And that doesn't just mean when we're young. It means when we're older as well. Still giving that honor and that cherish to our parents. Even when we might disagree with them. We still give them that honor. And we still give them that cherish. Did Jesus follow the fourth commandment? Absolutely. He had to be in his father's house, had to obey his father as well in heaven. But we see in Jesus doing everything right. So as he gathered at the Passover with his family, as he gathered on Holy Week, looking to the sacrifice that forgives us all our sins. Amen. And now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Please rise for prayer. And we especially add to our prayers today uh, Muriel, who uh, has been found to have a positive test of COVID. And obviously we keep her husband in our prayers, Bob, as well. So especially add to our prayers, Bob and Muriel, in our prayers. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for every blessing, every gift that you grant to us. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of faith. We thank you for the gift of peace. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us, that we belong to you. We thank you that you have created us and made us anew, O oh Lord. We especially pray for those who celebrate that creation with their birthdays this week. As we pray for Jacob, Christopher, Carol, Annika, Sharon, Eunice, Linda, Terry, Robert, Jack, Susan, Andy, Mary, Carol, and Penny. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, be with uh, this congregation that you have gathered together here at Berea. Guide us, lead us. We pray for your protecting hand. We pray, Lord, for the opportunities to share you and share your gospel. For those that are sick and hurting, we lift up into your hands Beth, Ruth, Marlos, Jack, Hakia, Ruth Ann, Beth, Agnes, Marlene, Les, Ryan, Lois, Millie, Michael, Lil, Sue, David, Heather, Terry, George, Catherine, Andrew, Barb, and Mark. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask, Lord, during this COVID season that you will watch over all of us. Be with those that are receiving the vaccine. Be with those, Lord, that are helping others, whether serving them, feeding, giving medical attention, seeking other answers. Grant them, Lord, your wisdom and your protecting hand. Be with all of those who are sick, who have this virus, but especially, Lord, we lift up Muriel, Janice, and Daryl. Bless them, keep them, and protect them, Lord. We ask for your healing hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. We pray for our friends, our family, our loved ones. We especially, Lord, lift up Joan, Doug, Amy, Steve, Debbie, Marlis, Mabel, Steve, Anita, Marilyn, Norma, Warren, Carol, Larry, Mark, Keith, Jean, and Albert. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for our care ministry here at Berea as we seek to serve, as we seek to teach, as we seek to help to teach those young ones that you have given to us. Bless the teachers. Bless those who serve. Bless those children, O oh Lord, that come here to Berea. Guide them and lead them and bless them, O oh Lord. And as many of our schools look to reopen, we ask for your safety, we ask for your leadership. May this be a blessing as we go forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with our nation. Guide us, lead us, especially during this time of transition. Be with all of our elected officials as they continue to serve, as some Finish the last serving of this term. Bless them and keep them, O Lord. For those that will be continuing, watch over them. And for those who will be placed into elected office soon, watch over and bless them, O Lord. Grant all of them your wisdom and your strength, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring this all before you, O Lord seeking your wisdom and your strength through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary, for should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. For in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have given us a new revelation of your glory, that seeing you in the person of your Son, we may be drawn to the love of those things which are not seen. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Begotten. 